to see because it's such a small lot. But I wanted to include the city limits to show you where it was in proximity to that. The, the question here is it's not that obviously they need, need water and sewer, but the question here is not that they're having problems, there was some mistake as far as understanding and getting into it, right? Yeah. Yes, sir, that would be correct. And as Mr. Bateman noted, uh, we take measures to take care of that in the future, at least on the staff level. And you did state water was around it? Yes, uh, the houses surrounding it are all kept on in our existing customers today. Any, any problems, any questions to council? No, right now. Any? No. Put that on the agenda for tomorrow night, please. And just for the record, we do have a signed annexation petition and utility agreement. Okay. All right. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Dan. Thank you. Third item, uh, if you recall, at the uh, March 4th session, Lisa Wolf uh, uh, had a presentation concerning uh, uh, special events policy and application process that we feel like we need to uh, implement in, in terms of trying to control uh, or have a, a good idea and a handle on, on, on the various events that's going on on the city property. Um, a great example this weekend, well, I'm sorry, upcoming is a, a function downtown that the city is involved with. There's two more 5Ks that day we found out, which uh, uh, it's around town that does put a significant amount of pressure on police. Um, and we believe that uh, uh, kind of taking this through a one stop shopping area to, to, to get through one department, and that department works with all the other departments, we can better handle these, uh, these various. Uh, Event. So Lisa, you want to? Sure. Um, hopefully you all have had the time to review it. I know Council Member Ward, you have wanted some extra time um, to go through it. But it's a thorough representation of the needs that are before us on a daily basis for events, not just our events. But <clears throat> the events I used to last month is with United Way um, and other organizations that are wanting to use streets downtown and facilities downtown. So, um, were there any specific questions that? Yeah, I, I look back through it, and I, I'd like to make a suggestion. Okay. And I'd like to, somewhere in this form, and it may be implicit, but, but I should run and spell it out. I'd like the city to reserve the right to request additional information or documentation with respect to the application, either prior to or after the permit approval. It, but that, I think, I think that would be good because if something didn't come in or you see something that you needed a little bit more, and, and that's why I say prior to or even after this approval, it may be something. Uh, I just wouldn't want the applicant to say, well, you know, I gave it all to you then, you know, you should have asked that one. So I just throw that out as a suggestion. Uh, I think it'd be helpful from the staff perspective. Okay. Sure. I agree with that.
but uh, uh, these guys will go over kind of where we are, review the potential operations, uh, and provide you some additional information that we've got since the last time that we've talked about this, which I believe was uh, 18 months ago, I'm not sure. Jay? Yes. Um, Eric's going to Eric's going to start off at the beginning and talk about the station uh, as far as uh, working with architect and where we are with all that. Yeah, Harold pretty much nailed most of my slide points here. <laughs> the, uh, the property office has been purchased for Station 6. Uh, we have extended the sanitary sewer line to the station and actually installed a tap line for the property. While we were out there, we encountered rock. And, um, it was decided between engineering, water resources, fire, and, and myself, it'd be smart just to go ahead and install the tap while we were there because it was going to be about 18 feet deep. It would save money in the long run. Architect, uh, as you know, has been selected and they're on board. We've reviewed several uh, conceptual floor plans. We've settled on a, a conceptual design. They're producing a detailed floor plan now. As they develop the floor plan, when they finish that, they'll do elevation drawings so that we'll get the schematic design finished. We'll know what it looks like inside, what it looks like from the outside, and then we'll review that. And at that point, they can do a cost estimate um, based on what kind of materials for exterior, what kind of design for exterior we select, what kind of um, floor plan we end up with. So we'll have a cost estimate finished um, when that uh, conceptual schematic designs complete. That gives us a question of timing. Uh, we'll probably have the design complete based on what we're seeing right now with Pace uh, sometime early August. That means we can go out to bid at that point and we'll put the contract out for bid. We'll receive bids back. <clears throat> it takes anywhere from six to eight weeks to go through that process. So sometime in September, we'll have the bids back. It usually takes a month to work through that. Uh, let you all review it and then get it through the, uh, the process of award. And then from the time of award until the time of construction completion, then we're between 10 and 12 months, depending on weather and things like that. So we're, in big picture terms, looking at occupying the new station sometime in November of 15. And uh, I'll just say that I appreciate the effort that's gone into this project. We've done a lot of front end work on this project. I've worked with IT to determine what we need for IT resources, what the station can offer IT in terms of backup locations. We've talked to engineering uh, on the sewer line. Water and Sewer was gracious enough to uh, let us add the tap. I worked with the fire guys quite a bit on the conceptual floor plans. So, a lot of uh, departments in the city have been involved in this project already so far, putting together some of these numbers and strategies. And I think we're working pretty well together, and I would say thank you to those folks that have helped so far. But with that brief overview, I'll be glad to entertain any questions you might have about the, uh, the status of the project itself. Eric, why don't you just review the site, make sure that everybody knows the site's located. Uh, it's off of Bonner Bridge. Uh, it's close to Highland Elementary. If you're going down Bonner Bridge towards the elementary school, it's on the left, kind of in a curve. Uh, it's not too far from Cox Toyota, by the way the crow flies. You know, I've had one citizen already call in. It's a legitimate request. Um, a large majority of them, probably 90% of the traffic coming out of that station, we can't get a light. Uh, there are times that essentially uh, it seems like on Saturdays that we, we do have some traffic blocked up going into the school to pick up kids if you take a left going back into Macintosh. Um, Saturday traffic out there is really, really tough. Uh, built there is cool traffic. They blocked all the way back out on Bottom Bridge. I want to make a huh? I want to make a make a Oh, oh yeah, I've heard it's fun. Yeah, it's <laughs> actually, actually way, way, way back. Yeah, back I'm very sorry to have that. Though. But uh, there's been some other days, no one. That we've had some traffic out. Uh, yeah, I think we're trying to work with the principal on that some to start to get people off that road. Uh, well, you know, when the, from the beginning of that school, they had two-way traffic coming in, two lines. But are they cut it back to one? Well, they, what I've seen. The there's still two. I'm, I'm sorry. There's still there's two lines. But, um, they've done better recently. But at one point, uh, they would walk down the line, mm -hmm. so you end up with a single line as they were walking up the line to let people now they're letting the cars come to them if that makes sense yeah, yeah. so 
what well, used to be they would move X amount forward and yep. then empty both lines so you wouldn't have any problems with kids crossing the line of right. traffic. Yeah. Okay. That's a good slide. Any other questions on that? And we, like Harold said, we, that question was posed to us and the situation where the station is located, the primary district will be back towards, you know, back toward the university. So we're, we're going to be hanging that right out probably 95% of the time. And if we do have to hang left and there's a bunch of traffic, nothing can be worse than Church Street. we got two stations pulled out on Church Street now, so we'll, we'll make all that. Okay, um, so we're really here uh, talking about our resource planning. We've had uh, several different presentations with you guys. We started back in, uh, in, in January of 2010 at a council retreat. Uh, so we talked about that, and then we had the study presentation after it was complete in June of 2011. And then uh, the Center for Public Safety Excellence came back again in August and did it. They did, you guys, the work session, and then they did it the, uh, uh, at, on the, at the city council meeting where it was uh, taped. Uh, we had a meeting in March as well to talk about some of the communication issues that were brought out in the study that we got cleared up on some times that were presented in the study. And then uh, in April of 13, we did an update on the staffing. So we've, we've had several different um, presentations about this uh, along the way and you know we're just here to kind of review and go back over some of that so uh, currently I'm gonna see if I don't mess this up right here currently this is the map of the city and so uh, the different colors of the different station districts and I'll just start in the east as station three uh, that's uh, on Wilkins Street Grand Hotel Road uh, we have one engine company there uh, one truck with three guys as a minimum each day. Um, station two is down here on Webb Avenue. We have another truck there with a three-man crew. Uh, as all these are minimum staffings. And then headquarters station 215 South Church Street. Uh, that's where the engine comp, the engine uh, ladder truck, the battalion chief, and the squad, which is like a, a utility truck that runs out of there. Um, station five on Industry Drive have a three-man three crew there at that station. Station four, we have a three-man crew, and then we have squad two, which is a two-man crew that primarily, they're running all the calls in Forest District, but um, primarily they're there to catch the medical calls to keep engine four available for anything <coughs> in the west. Uh, this is the station, this is the location for station six. Uh, you have University Drive, you turn on the Bonner Bridge. Uh, this area here uh, is the school area, so we're right, essentially right next to the school, right there. So that's the proposed location uh, for Station 6. Um, as you recall, when, when we had our other presentations, the, uh, the Center for Public Safety Excellence came in. They did a study. Uh, the department worked with them, and, and we went through our operations we talked about several different things, and at the last time that we talked with you guys, our recommendation was uh, based on the Center for Public Safety Excellence recommendation was that, that we staff Station 6 with an engine company, a ladder truck, and a battalion chief. So that would be 15 additional staff in total, five more people each day to staff all of those vehicles. And then we will be moving six people from Station 4, uh, where Squad 2 is at, we move six down. So that would give us 21 at this particular station, or seven people each day, because we have three shifts. So uh, for the timeline for the completion of Station 6, you have the station construction and all that's involved. But then you go in that we have to hire and train the additional employees. We have to purchase the necessary fire trucks. So we're talking about, that's almost a year, 320 to 40 days to construction of the fire trucks. 
So that's a process out front that we have to work through. We have to revise and add procedures because we have different pieces of apparatus, different staffing, um, and then we have to develop the new computer-based response districts for dispatch. So we have different trucks. Once that happens, different vehicles go to different calls than what they used to when they get on those edges because the districts will be changed like we showed you in the map. But as you can see, this plan revising the procedures and, and the computer-based response, this is about the whole city. I mean, we're talking about Station 6 and staffing the personnel for Station 6, but it affects the whole city, our fire service throughout the whole city. As far as people backing in, uh, additional units coming in to help, and who's coming. Uh, when you pull a truck from one station, then essentially that district is, is left uncovered. So all of these things go into our planning and procedures. So it's a citywide process. Um, as far as the operational costs, we've talked about this before, but the operational costs would be 15 additional employees. Uh, the employee equipment package, that's their, their turnout gear, the radio, all the equipment that they need, uniforms, um, everything that goes along with that. There'll be additional utility costs for the station and then vehicle operating costs. When you put all that stuff together, the number that you're looking at as operational costs per year is a million dollars. That's that's where you're at. Did you say that per year? Yes. What did you say? That's yes, sir. That's the operational cost. It's a million a year for all those. But that covers, you know, everything on that as far as the utility costs and all that. Yeah, but that's just talking about one station. That's correct. Chief, how much, uh, it's, it's obviously you don't have to replace the uh, turnout here. You don't have that every year, do you? No, we don't have that every year. That's, um, that's the startup cost. So it would be a little bit less than that, but you're going to have the startup cost of buying that. We still have to, those people will be, get in the system as far as replacing the gear because the gear has to re be replaced. So, so it is, the startup is a little bit more than the, than the perpetual cost each year. But as far as the, as far as the, the annual, it's just about a million dollars when you think about all that, as far as their clothing each year, things that, the things that they have. So that's the operational cost. Um, the next thing that we have is the capital cost. So for this particular station, we have to buy um, two engines. There'll be two uh, large apparatus, and then one full-size passenger vehicle. That's the vehicle that the battalion chief will be riding in each day, which is essentially a, a pickup truck with a camper shell on the back. So he'll have all the equipment that he would carry for his particular job. And the capital cost for that is would be 1.4 million for all of those. Um, and so that doesn't include the station. So the stations out there, the capital startup costs, and then the operational costs. Okay, so we're talking about uh, having these people and what they're going to do, and, and the engine and the ladder and the battalion chief. So that's what we're talking about. So this is what the each one of those. Uh, people or, or apparatus and stuff functions will do. So the standard fire engine company needs assessment. That's the standard fire truck that you're thinking about. Um, the developed size of the general area in the proximity of Station 6 site as it relates to other areas of the city that we already have an ordinary engine company based at the fire station. So it's another area of the city uh, requiring an engine company that's comparable to the rest of the city. Uh, the response time factors pertain to searching and safely removing trapped occupants in a structure fire before they succumb to the exposure of fire products. The response time factor in relation to the ability to, for quickly flowing water on fires before it grows beyond the department's capabilities to extinguish it before the total destruction. So, and then the response time factor relates to providing patient care rapidly during emergency medical situations to increase and uh, the chance for successful recovery. So we're talking about getting there, uh, safely removing people, safety for our personnel, uh, quickly flowing water into the fire, 
and then response time for emergency medical calls. Also, our goal is consistent with the National Fire Protection Association of having the standard engine company arrive on scene within four minutes or less after responding from their station 90% of the time. So that's the goal that we're shooting for because time is distant. Distance, distance is time. So uh, the farther you're gonna have to go, the more your response time is. So that's why that station uh, is needed out there because of the large response time from the other units trying to cover into that area now. The impact of this type of resource affects our national, our North Carolina response rating schedule or another term is the ISO. Uh, and also the distribution of this type of company affects the department's ability to comply with the Department of Labor regulations pertaining to emergency operations, which is two in and two out. As far as our safety, when we have staff going in at a working fire, uh, we have to have two people on the outside as a safety factor for those people that are working inside in case there was an emergency, they have to be in, uh, be able to go in and get them out. And then uh, this truck and crew will be part of an effective response force deployed for the structured fires and larger incidents. So it's part of a group of people to put the fire out. So it's, it's one of the uh, components of that. The ladder truck, the distance in the general proximity to Station 6 site is well beyond the capabilities of the larger ladder truck operating in headquarters fire station as it pertains to an adequate response time. Again, response time, the ladder truck uh, going out that far uh, to do the job of the ladder truck. Also, uh, there are 67 buildings that are classified by the North Carolina Response Rating Schedule, or ISO, as needing a ladder truck and crew in this area of the city to reach upper levels of a structure and to flow large amounts of water for a fire, uh, for fire extinguishment from an elevated position. Essentially, the, little, the, the first benchmark for ISO saying that you need a ladder truck is five buildings. It's, it, it talks about height and then a 3,500 gallon per minute fire flow. Those are reasons that you would need that. And currently, just in the area that this truck would cover, it's not talking about the whole city. Just where this truck will cover, we have 67 buildings that, uh, that fall into that category right now. Uh, the large size ladder truck carries supplemental equipment designed for rescue operations associated with safely extracting patients from motor vehicle accidents. So we have, uh, we have res specialized rescue equipment on that truck as well. And then the ladder truck crew will prove the additional part of the effective response force to Florida structure fires in larger incidents. That's a, they're another factor of people coming to take care of the event. And then also the ladder truck uh, is part of our goal of the National Fire Protection Association of having the total effective response force, that's the group of people, on scene within eight minutes or less after responding from their station 90% of the time. So that ladder truck is part of that total group it should be there, our goal of, of eight minutes or less. And there's no way that they can make that now working on the operation that we have 90% of the time. Okay, so we talked about the engine, we talked about the ladder truck, and now we're to the battalion chief. So the battalion chief, the responsibilities are, are what they would be doing is the distance and general proximity, uh, general area and the proximity is fire station six is well beyond the capabilities of the current battalion chief operating from headquarters station as it pertains to response time. So you've got this one battalion chief that we have each day, and they're responding from headquarters fire station to all the multi-company operations uh, calls. Our operating procedure is consistent with the National Incident Management System for having control and coordination over incidents that create hazards for our responders. This person's managing the scene. Uh, we work on an incident management system, so they're there as the incident commander primarily uh, when they respond. In addition, to, uh, resources at Station 6, they would exceed the span of control for the current battalion chief for emergency and normal operating functions for supervision. Right now, the battalion chief's covering all the other five stations with the supervisors <coughs> as far as the, the captain's stuff that they supervise. So they're looking after all the people that day, essentially. They're captains that help them, but but they're responsible for everything as well as on fires, assigning people to calls. You have multiple calls. We're, we're always on multiple calls. Well, not always, but 
many times multiple calls. So that person can't handle all that because they're calling all the shots on that. Um, so that person would be, uh, would be part of that as far as the span of control that would break that up and essentially we'd be split, splitting the city in half. The battalion chiefs are part of the overall effective response force. So they're a piece of the puzzle that goes in for that uh, effective response force for the number of staff that we need. Essentially, I just went through, um, as far as the cost, I talked about the stations, and then broke down each piece of apparatus and, and what they would be doing. And, uh, you know, really that's the, that's the needs that we have. So I don't know if you guys have any questions about that. I know we've uh, been through this a few times and talked about it, so I know you're familiar with it. Well, the EMS, if you have an EMS service out there, will it come off Barnesdale? Well, essentially that's, that's what you would think, and, and that could happen lots of times, but they're all over the place. So those guys at that station on, uh, over there on Boone Station, they're going to run a call in Elon, and they're going to run a call in Altamaha, Ossipee, and you know they're just that's just the base for them. So they're all over the place. So <coughs> you have an EMS unit at Station Six. Those guys would run. They would run medical calls just as all the other stations do now. So it would be the same. It would be the same process. Yeah, right. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <coughs> it's taking a larger ladder truck out of there. I'm sorry. They're not using that large ladder truck. To if we have to, we do. If we don't, if we don't have any other units available, and there's a medical call, we don't we not respond. So we're not the first response vehicle out of that pre-MT call. It would not be the first response out of that station. Uh, but sometimes they do have to run. If engine, like downtown, if engine one's on the call, then, then they're going to cover in. We want to be sure that we have someone to go. We're not going to not go if we have people available. Guys, if y'all recall, at one point in time there was a conversation about uh, closing station, and station two was identified, smaller area. Jay, you had a slide about the additional research in terms of the number of calls. We went back and pulled up two. Uh, this one? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think we'll do that if you would. Okay. Um, it's a little bit, um, a, lot of, a whole lot of lines in there because we have the we have the street layout in there. But, but what we're saying uh, right now is that essentially, uh, here's, that's Sydney Avenue, I think. I'm trying to figure that out on all these lines. But, but what we're saying is if we were to close Station 2, that was, a, that was an option of things that we talked about. And we went back and reviewed that. And, and we have, as far as the recommendation, if you remember at that time, we didn't rec we didn't think that that was a good thing to do. Uh, it was an option if, if that's what happened, but it was not a good thing to do based on our operations and all the things that I covered with you here. But, but we're saying that Station 2, that's not a good option to close Station 2. And primarily as we go back and look, um, Station 2's calls would have to be split up between somebody. Somebody's got to go if they're there no longer. So there's a 400. Web Avenue, Avenue, you're right. That's correct, Web Avenue. So um, there will be 457 additional calls for Station 5 out here on the Industry Drive. So as we split that district up, 5 is going to have to cover 454. That's, that's a primary response. You know, if they're available and something happens in that area, they're going to pick up that many more calls. But what that does, when you do that, that's why I talked about it's about the whole city. What that does is automatically 457 more times that unit's going to be unavailable for a call. If you have a call in the industrial area or anywhere that's their primary district now, which is these areas here, that's additional 457 times that they're not going to be available. As well as Engine 1, or Station 1, which is the busiest station that we have, they'll be picking up 400, uh, 514 additional calls. Again, what that's doing, that's 514 more times that, that that truck would be unavailable for another call. 
and they run with each other. So they, they're going to help each other. If it's just a car fire or a medical call, we have one truck going. If we have a structure fire, an automatic alarm, a smoke detector, CELO talk about all these trucks and smoke detector. Well, smoke detector tells us to smoke in a house. If we don't know any different, that's what we think it is. And we have to send a force to be ready to fight a structure fire because we don't know any different. We, we change up if we get additional info. But that's what that does right there. You have to split that district up. And part of that district over here, um, it may be feasible for Station 3 on Grand Hopedale Road in Wilkins for 3 to come uh, pick up some of this area right back over here. But essentially, they really can't get there faster than one can. So uh, they're going to be there. Now, if you have a structure fire here, and we talked about the two stations, Station 1 is going to come, Station 3 is going to come. And then anything to the western part of uh, the eastern part of the city, if those two units are on a call, whether it's an automatic alarm or structure fire, the next thing to go to East Burlington is going to be Station 5 out on Industry Drive. They have to come all the way through town to go out to the east side. Or to go up to the north side, uh, like for Glen Ray, they're going to have to cover all the way up to that area with four coming from the mall over that way to help them as well. So it just creates holes if we do that. So. Chief, based on what we've seen in the studies, what, what do we anticipate the, the cost for service count be in that administration? Station, um, currently as we are, Station 1 is the is the lead station, and Station 4 is right behind them. I, I don't know that I have those numbers. Um, station 1 ran uh, in 2013. Station 1 ran 2,211 calls, and Station 4 was right behind. They were our second leading station with 2,160 calls. And station 4 is? Uh, uh, South Church South Street. Church. Mall. I'm sorry. Um, so they're, they're really helping with 4 as far as knowing those that number of calls because station six would be uh, primary to their district okay but also the ladder truck itself would be covering the ladder truck calls it's where we have them coming from headquarters station downtown now so that station would be covering a general district and then the ladder truck out of there would be covering a larger essentially half the city when, on all the calls. when station six comes on board how do you shift the responsibility, say for four, for example? Which way does it go? Because obviously four is coming where the covering where six is going to go. That's correct. Um, you're saying how do we decide to? How are, somewhere along the line, someone has to shift, or the territory changes, or the district changes. Right. So I guess my question would be, which way does it shift? That is generally on. I get, the better question is who's going to get some relief? Well, one's going, to get, one's going to get relief to start with because of the ladder truck situation. Right. The battalion chief's going to get relief because he's covering from down here, covering the whole city. Right. So you have that. And then what we do is we just look uh, with Andrew helping us out. Uh, through GI, GIS and, and our response districts, then we're going to go in, uh, we'll go in up here and and cut part of this area out for Station 6 is what we would do. Okay. Now, the bigger part about relief is the coverage, the, the back-end coverage, the fill-in. So what I mean is, if we have a fire right here, then Station 6 is going and Station 4 is going. Right now, we have a fire right here. Station four is going, but then station one is coming all the way out here to help them. They're back up, or possibly five, depending on where it's at. Right. right. So essentially, everybody gets relief in the process. Okay. And another issue we're in with three guys is that if you come to the south with three uh, towards the interstate, uh, we've got a uh, we've got a train track to cross. Right. Right along in here. So that's, yeah, that's right. Yeah. And there's no way to know until you get there or something. Our, our units uptown work around that to go under the underpass just to be safe. It takes a little longer sometimes, but you never get caught. 
but that's a situation that you're not going to cover. And that's what I'm saying from here, with these guys trying to cover back into this area right here, it's just trying to split it up a little more. It's just not feasible to do that, actually. Uh, we had some discussion about closing the station, and the one that we targeted, I guess, was two. Mm -hmm. You obviously have given us information about saying that's not a good idea. But if you had to close one, and dollars were a factor, which one would it be? If you had to. If you're telling me we have to, that's that's the only option anywhere would be that station. But and I'm not I'm not right. in favor of closing the station. I understand that. But I just wanted to. Yeah, want there is there is no other option if that's what your choice okay. is. Okay. But you know, we pretty much stayed it all along. We didn't think that was a good thing. Right, and I, I would support that same thing. Any other questions for Chief Smith? In reference to interstate incidents, which is uh, we tend to have one of the larger incidents in terms of the traffic issues. Uh, of course, five can go uh, east. But with six out here, it can it can take an awful lot of the west, and it can begin to split that up. And one might have to, a major interstate issue might have three states at a time to fly to that. We we normally have two anyway, but. The problem is with the interstate, four covers part of the interstate now and five covers part. The problem with station five is there's no access to interstate immediately. So they have to go industry drive all the way back to Maple Avenue if they're wanting to cover a section back to the west or they got to go all the way down to Alamance Road, continue west or come back east. So they have to go a long way around just to get to the interstate. It's where this one will have um, access, uh, quicker access to the interstate. We're, we continue to work on that Tucker Street to change, by the way. That'd be awesome. That would be awesome right now. Oh, my Yeah. That'd be awesome um, for us. Harold, start up one time cost on this would be what? Forget the construction work and all that outside of that. Uh, it's a, it's, it's the two trucks and the, the capital would be the two trucks okay. and the building. And we've, and we've got money reserved out of reserves to cover that. So we're working on this project in this budget we're currently getting ready to go into. Last year we put started back in operation, we put back five hundred thousand dollars towards the million dollars. This year our goal was to add another two hundred two fifty back to so when you get into the fifteen, sixteen operational year when you open up, you would only look at about another two hundred fifty thousand dollar increase to cover your entire operations going forward. In other words, the money's been layered to try to prepare you, so it wouldn't be a million dollar shock in one year. Okay. Any other questions for Chief Smith? Now, hiring, we won't get too far ahead of ourselves, but we, before the time you train, we'd probably have to start hiring uh, late this coming fiscal year, and certainly I'm on board. Now, Eric's Pretty aggressive on his plan, like in this thing through in 12 months, but this is probably <clears throat> maybe December 1, 15, before this thing opens. Uh, uh, time to get, get it built, put people in there, and start operating. Oh, that's a good point, dude. Okay, let's say we open it December 1, 15. When did you have to have the 15 people, um, the employee equipment, all that? So, when do we have to have that in place to move forward for December 15? We would need a minimum, of, a minimum, like you'd be squeaking in on a year, but you're going to need a year to have the apparatus ordered. So it's going to take a year to get the apparatus there that you need. Uh, the training process is a 12, is a 12 week process. Just from, from start to finish is a 12 week process. Now, what we talked about is uh, potentially staggering or, or just doing the whole 15 at one time. We don't know, we've never done 15. I've, Never done 15 since I've been here. But, so we're trying to work out that process to we do the whole 15. But one thing that Harold talked to us about this, that was I think was kind of a, a little eye opening thing for him is that when Station 6 comes online, when we put people there, you're, you flip a switch. Yesterday, you're running as no Station 6. Today at 8 o'clock in the morning, you flip a switch. And all the computer stuff works the new way because you can't have it in between. They can't be dispatching calls for six and six not there up and running. So that's all the all those procedural uh, computer-based stuff has to be done and worked out. That takes some time to do as well. 
So uh, the truck, the, the farthest out would be the trucks, as far as a year on the trucks, if you forget about the station part of it. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Hi, Gary. Uh, okay. Uh, public transportation. Uh, Mike has been uh, visiting our, our other municipalities. Uh, actually, it appears uh, the next week to 10 days is really key times for both Mevin and Graham in terms of a potential decision to be made. Um, we indicated before Gibson Bill has committed uh, and the other two cities uh, is at the council level. This is all I can tell you right now. All um, rivers are not. Pardon me? All rivers are not. Oh yeah, all rivers are not. Yeah, we can talk about major talking about Medin, Graham, Burlington. And and very very voting tomorrow, right? Uh, I let Mike tell you the dates that were okay. uh, Elon is uh, really in, in a kind of a holding pattern with a, a new manager, uh, and I'll let Mike go into more detail about that. But uh, I, I, I don't know. I don't. I don't. I don't think a pending decision is, ne is nearly as close on Elon as it is potentially on Mavin and Graham. So uh, Mike, I want to just go through where you are, the beach you've been to, and then uh, where we are as we go forward from the night. Sure. Thank you, uh, As you know, I have been out talking to, to our partners and community in the area. I just put together a list of where we've been. Uh, mentioned Gibsonville, the approval in January. Uh, they did that that night at the same meeting. They had a motion to approve that. I met with individual council members of Elon on January 30th, 23rd. Uh, we got the notification from Hall River that they would not be, uh, be able to hire a position to be involved. Went to Graham's board retreat, gave a presentation on the 24th of February. I met uh, individually with the mayor and new manager with Elon on February 24th. Went to the city council on March 3rd, which was the beginning of our ice and snow. Uh, that's why you're going to see like a two week delay. That didn't really happen. A lot went home, but not a lot with this presentation. Um, went and did a uh, short radio call in show with WBAG. Uh, went back to Graham. They had a call to public hearing at a council meeting specifically for transit. Let the public speak. I gave a little presentation. Uh, it is on their agenda tomorrow night. I'm going back to that meeting. It's, they're going to consider a vote or a discussion, but they've already had their public hearing. Uh, Mevin is having a public hearing on Thursday. I'll be at that giving a presentation just for transit. It, it, it is on their agenda for the next council meeting, which is the 7th. I just spoke with the Elon staff and will be attending a board retreat there on April 10th. To give them a presentation together as a group. Um, I'm not sure what will be on their agenda, but uh, that's the next step. So Carol mentioned they had a new manager, uh, things like that. But uh, that's where I've been. Um, heard lots of questions, new questions, old questions. Um, and, and just at the end, I always ask them to let us know their intent. If that's something that we'll be participating in so we can go forward if we do. Question for Mark. Yeah, Mevin would have probably had an answer earlier, but the ice got them uh, the meeting with council, I believe. Yeah, the night I was there, I was speaking about five minutes in, they, they just called it. It was that, that night that it started. We really didn't know it was going to snow and ice as much as it did the first time. So we sort of got delayed that night. They were in action that night, but it didn't, it didn't have time to go So with the time available, they did call a public, it was a special public meeting before they had a Fine, everybody agreed to, we sent it out to a contractor or whatever, to, to be it on contractors, to be it on one to do service. What kind of time frame would we look at from sending it out to actually getting it up running a year, year and a half? Yeah, it's, it's definitely, definitely beyond 12 into the 18 months now. To do everything we need to do, you know, the details to the, to the equipment, there's a lot to be done. Um, you can, Hit some speed up your schedule a little bit along the way, but that, that will be your time period. Yeah, and now, well, somebody said it's declined to come in. That sort of throws a 
uh, rent into it on where it, do we just do for Burlington? Or do we do for the Burlington uh, Gibsonville? Uh, since those are the only two cities right now that they're in. Do we bypass Elon? That was, that was a question that came up under the Elon and uh, Greg. Yeah. And at this time, I answered yes. We would have to do either. If we had to go through, for efficiency we would, but you wouldn't be able to stop, or we would look at other alternatives to route us in a different fashion. I mean, until others make decisions about how we're going to do that. But if you weren't going to participate, uh, you wouldn't have to serve. Same question, do we go to ACC, do we go to the county seat? Yeah, good question. Right. Yeah, if, if somebody grams at the county seat and wants to come to Berlin, you know, you say, no, you can't ride a, a you pay it just $2 fare <coughs> anyway to ride, maybe. If they pay for if they pay the fare, then we don't return. If they don't, if they don't join, they don't play. It's real simple. You know, if Graham doesn't join, Graham's not going to get a stop. Okay. Is that why? Right, Correct. That's, that's, that's now, how we I can work it. out if, if, let's say, the city of Burlington agrees, and then we want to make a run to community college in Burlington, then something would have to be worked out there. Not with greater, but with community college. Uh, President Gatewood has been attending all the public meetings now. Um, he's um, he came from urban area in Portland. He's a real proponent of this. Yeah. With Graham, and I think he's been on the end of it, and that meeting also. I think it's great that he would show up for public support and all that, but they need to think about bringing some money to the table if they want to something like that to be uh, from Burlington to say the community college, I would think. Some type of conversation about dollars. Any questions for Mike? Thank you, Mike. Mm -hmm.
they were calling in asking why they were getting letters. I haven't done anything wrong, but it was just an awareness issue that he wanted to step ahead um, of any problems. Zoning, um, some of the things you usually see from us are text amendments, food trucks, portable storage units, you see rezoning cases. Some of the things you not, may not be familiar with, we issue zoning certification letters, we work with customers on land development issues, uh, plan and plat review, sign permits, work with the Planning and Zoning Commission, Board of Adjustment, and rarely uh, court cases. Zoning enforcement, again, our CPC program. They use the phone, contact our guys, they head out. In this case, it's a junk car, and it's all gone. We've had perfect compliance with that program as well. We have not had to tow a car yet. Other issues that are zoning enforcement <coughs> is illegal signage. Um, we have picked up over 2,300 signs since we've had that increased enforcement effort. Um, we also handle landscape and fencing inspection and temporary storage complaints. We handle plan review. Um, here is um, Macintosh on the lake. Um, it's pre-construction. Here's um, their plan, and then here's the entryway nicely built out. Um, people bring in their plans to us. We review them in TRC. Um, we've got multiple departments across the city that are represented at this table, including uh, NCDOT. And here is a shot that Daniel Schaffner of our staff took from an airplane of Alamance Crossing before it became Alamance Crossing here. And then here it is over for business and bringing in tax dollars. We handle historic preservation. This is a map of the Beverly Hills District. And here are a couple of historic homes that are here in Burlington that are very beautiful. The Burlington Graham NPO transportation planning is handled through us as well. Um, Mike and Phil handle it. They uh, have put out this nice map in assistance with Andrew. Um, of our GIS, and it is a nice bike map of the area. Here is our pedestrian master plan that was adopted in 2012, and here is a plan for our road widening. They handle it other issues in addition to this, but these are some of the main things that they do. Community development, here's the end of before and the after, and then proudly here are some of the nice projects that we've had as a result of our efforts in uh, community development. Now, we assist other departments in various ways, but we're just gonna look at GIS mapping here. Here's one that you're probably familiar with. Uh, it's our leaf collection map. You've probably seen that around. And very coincidentally, with our fire discussion, looking at emergency evacuation. Here's the snow this year that paralyzed I-40. Here's a vehicle fire. This side of I-40 is definitely paralyzed. Got Amtrak going through here. Got uh, our park here with lots of people right in the heart of the city. Here's what GIS has made. It's an evacuation map for the fire department to respond to. We have a quarter mile evacuation zone, half mile, and one mile. They've also done that for the railroad and for city park. And those are critical life issues that uh, GIS is helping the fire department with. Long range planning, we're planning for the future. That's one thing that uh, most planners do. You've got to look ahead as far as you can into the future and try to figure out what's coming so that you can stay ahead of uh, the trends. One of the things here, Decennial Census, here are a couple maps that have been made um, with the data from the 2010 census. The census determines the federal money that we get. It can be between several hundred and several thousand dollars <coughs> per person. That's why the places I've worked, I've always got to really beat bushes to try to get people to respond to the census because it's extremely important and brings in a lot of money for our city. Um, 2010, uh, 2020 is <coughs> rapidly approaching. It's gonna be here before we know it. Um, the local update, of addressing program is going to start in probably about 2017. The 
training sessions will begin about 2016 for that. So since we're in 2014, it's very close. Here's our original city limits. And there's the current city limits. The future, who knows? Um, we've got a couple of facts here for you. Um, well, not facts exactly, but predictions. Um, pretty close to being factual with this one. About 20% of the, four, the population nationwide in 2040 is going to be over 65. That's something we need to think about. Um, there's all kinds of issues related to transportation as far as even people who are older being able to read a street sign from a certain distance in their houses <coughs> that have to be thought about. Um, lighting, things of that nature. Um, housing demand, there's predictions that we're going to shift to more rental usage, um, about 50% of the population. We're looking at um, smaller homes on smaller lots, attached homes, as far as what people are going to want for uh, dwellings. And as far as um, population goes, that's going to come up in just a second. We've got to look at our 2020, uh, 2035 comprehensive plan that we're working on. And you can see various um, departments in the city and various areas that are touched on in our plan that has gotten underway. We're going to have that first public meeting in May. All right, here's our population slide. 2010 is accurate. The rest of them are um, population projections that I've made um, using just a very conservative growth rate. And I really don't like using a conservative growth rate because there's so much that can happen. Um, for example, in Pittsburgh, uh, developers come in and has bought 7,500 acres and wants to develop it with shops and a lot of housing. Pittsburgh right now has about 4,000 people, and they're planning to <coughs> add 60,000 people through that development. So, like in 2000, nobody really saw a Macintosh on the lake coming. So something like that is happening in Pittsburgh could easily happen here. There's plenty of land around. So that's just something to keep in mind when you look at, at something like this. It's not always accurate, and you never know what we're going to end up with. Top 10 most populous states. Uh, I've got our figures down here. The uh, 20, 20, uh, excuse me, 2000 census, 2010 census, and then projections that are, I think, very accurate um, for our growth. If you look at, at the states here, in, 20, in 2000, we were not in the top 10. In 2010, we broke in to number 10. The next two census years, we are going to be projected to be number nine, and then 2040, we're going to be number eight. There's a lot of people moving to the state for retirement, for work, going to school. Um, so we're just continuing to increase, and we have to look to that in the future for our population projections and um, trying to plan out where everything, including fire stations, are going to go. The U.S. is uh, developing into what's called um, mega regions, and an individual region is um, referred to as a megalopolis. We're growing beyond simple city boundaries. People are wanting to live a more urban lifestyle, and so cities are starting to grow together, and you need to look with a regional view to the future. This is a satellite photo of the Earth at night, and you can see several regions really bright lights here in the U.S. You can see them over in Europe. Japan is pretty much just one bright light. And you can see with the satellite view, it's easier to see the mega regions. This one is ours. And if I can hold it steady enough, this is Raleigh, Durham. Here's Greensboro and Winston-Salem. This bright light right here in the middle, that's us. My, house. <laughs> <laughs> my, my kids don't turn any lights. <laughs> you got the power of being reason. <laughs> we show up on the satellite right. for this. <laughs> and you can see you can see the roadway connections, the highways as well. Now that region that we are a part of here is they've all got different names because this is a new thing in planning. Um, but it's called the Piedmont Atlantic region in most cases. And that region is home to 
give or take around 20 million people, um, stretches over to Birmingham, Alabama, through Atlanta. And as far as the economy goes, it has um, a place in the top 15 economic regions in the world. So that's very impressive and something to keep in mind for the future. And we're trying to work on economic development in our department. Um, we've established an economic development team. We have our first brochure starting a business in Burlington. It's not completely perfect, but it's something. And I've got copies of it here to give to you. Um, we have the first couple pages of our economic development booklet that we're going to be passing out um, when I'm writing recruitment letters, which I've already started doing making contact with various businesses to try to encourage them to locate here. Um, we're going to have a resource guide. Um, economic development plan is a very large and intensive publication, but we're going to try to do that in-house. Um, marketing economic development analysis. We're going to have a targeted advertising campaign that we've already done a lot of research on. Um, I've got some ideas for where I want us to start working on that, we have a new website for economic development, um, target industries, which will help us with our advertising campaign, have annual reports, and um, eventually we're gonna get into tourism promotion, because that's extremely important because we bring in lots of people, I think, especially with our wonderful recreation and parks department. We have so much going on there that we bring in so much money. I was at a conference last year learned a lot about that and it can just bring in tremendous amounts of revenue to our city. And my presentation. Questions for Ms. Nelson. Thank you, Ms. Nelson. Cheryl. Uh, questions about anything tonight or anything on the agenda for tomorrow? I just to brief update the uh, The reclassification study is, has been given to the staff. Uh, I'd ask Matt to come uh, tonight. He was out of town. Well, she's in bar night, but he will be uh, appearing for council on April the 15th. Thank you. Put that uh, forward. Um, we will also, uh, uh, in May, probably to talk at the 15th about uh, a day for the uh, budget workshop in May. Uh, we're meeting with departments uh, again this week. Um, I do know at the May, uh, May work session, Animal Services uh, would like to attend and start laying out some, some changes. Again, later we've hired there is this, uh, has some suggestions for us uh, uh, in terms of you have one actually on the agenda tomorrow night about having additional discount uh, weekends for adoptions. But also, I think she's going to be providing some information uh, on the tethering issue that they brought up to a number of you all. And she was involved in Orange County when they basically invented that program, 18 month program, uh, to get that in and how it potentially could work. So she'll be here. Uh, um, any other questions? Charles. Harold, I'd just like to point out that we're close to um, finishing up the work on our charter amendment in the In the boxes tonight, I'll put in a proposal to give the bookers finished. It would be nice if we could get that one to the legislature this year to get that off the table. Uh, it's there for you as a redline copy of the Changes were being made in clean cover to get some minor revisions. We feel in essence it's complete. If we uh, can review it between now and the second meeting this month, we can put it in a short session this year and get that out of the way. I'd like to do that. Will you be presenting that? Sir? Will you be presenting that second? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I put it in your box. Sure. So you can have to take a look at it. You want to bring it to us and let us take a look at it. And the council adopted it. Do you present it to the general assembly? Yes. I'll 
also uh, know in the debris update, uh, as of this afternoon, we have picked up 50,000 cubic yards, just under 50,000 cubic yards of uh, brush. Under two weeks, the first path, we had originally the projection had been 60,000. We were a little wrong. Somebody was wrong on that one. That, uh, we found that out. Uh, well, I, keep, I keep putting more out. The yeah. <laughs> decoration was made today, which is good to use for all of us. We got a week and a half left in the first pass. Um, you know, I think Eric and some of the other way in, and they met late this afternoon, and now they may be projecting maybe as much as a hundred thousand cubic yards. Um, uh, so this thing will probably extend beyond the six weeks we talked about. been really good and in, in uh, patient. Um, some, some, some areas really got hit really hard, guys. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, we'll keep you updated on that. And those guys are going seven days a week now. Yeah. Do they have folks in, I know we did approach them by zone. Mm -hmm. Do they have the operators in each zone? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Anything else, guys? Mayor and council members, at the last work session, we talked about the hours that we were having a work session started at the 6th. And when I had made the motion to do that, I was under the impression that we were going to keep it at 5 o'clock like we did the last couple of work sessions. Mm -hmm. So uh, my question to you guys is, I'd like the mayor to move it back to the early hours instead of the 6 o'clock to 7 hours. What about 4? Works for me. About 7 8. <laughs> I can do that too. Or, or, or six. Yeah. Four o'clock in the morning. I'm up. You're totally flexible. You can still at 7 a.m. get out of the way. That's my man. Yeah. I'm up. Yeah, I'm up. Yeah. So this may have if we if, if, back to five. That's up to you guys. What do you want to do? Uh, I think what Sudo said was uh, he misunderstood the way I stated it. And uh, what he said to me tonight is he'd like to bring it back up. So the question is, would you guys like to start these work sessions at 5 o'clock as opposed to 6 or 6.15 for food and 7 o'clock the meeting? That's the question. Uh, the question is, we come in at 5, go to work, then take a break, come back, finish up. That's right. That's good for me. Yeah. <laughs> Five o'clock from your own, guys. Thank you. Thank you.